Hello, and welcome back to Kate's Arcade. I'm Kate, and it's uh, been a hot minute since I've done one of these reviews, so what do you say we just jump right in? Spider-Man for the PlayStation 4 has finally released. Last September. Yeah, I'm a little late to this review, but better late than never. Released on September 7th, 2018, Insomniac Spider-Man was a highly anticipated title amongst many webheads, including myself. I've always been a big fan of the wall crawler, and Insomniac is one of my favorite developers. So, originally when I saw this game announced back in 2016, it's safe to say I was immediately on board. After seeing the fantastic job they did on Sunset Overdrive for the Xbox One, it seemed like a no-brainer their next title should be a Spider-Man game. And as it turns out, I wasn't the only one who felt this way. It was after the success of their Xbox exclusive that both Sony and Marvel came to Insomniac and asked which Marvel title they would like to work on. Without skipping a beat, Insomniac chose Spider-Man. Fast forward two and a half years later from its official announcement, and here we are. While there are many things that can make a game great, there's only one thing that truly matters to me. Let's take a look at the replayability of Spider-Man. Right off the bat, this game doesn't waste any time with its introduction. In just a few short minutes, the story visually tells you everything you need to know about Peter Parker and where he's at in life. Shortly after, the game immediately puts you right in the driver's seat as you swing your way to the first mission. All of this happens while an awesome soundtrack plays, hyping you up for the emotional roller coaster you're about to go on. It's safe to say I greatly enjoyed the opening and couldn't wait to see what the game had in store. After the thrilling introduction, however, the story's pacing slows down a bit. While I can see how people would take issue with this, honestly, it wasn't a problem for me. I appreciated the developers taking their time with the first half of the game to really cement and develop the characters you're going to be interacting with along Peter's journey. Which by the way, this game is filled to the brim with charming character interactions that will have you falling in love with these familiar faces all over again. From genuinely funny moments, to scenes that left me in tears. You can tell that Insomniac put a lot of love and care when it came to writing the story. Despite it being a 15 hour game, Insomniac managed to cram in a meaningful narrative that will have you engaged from start to finish. There wasn't a single moment that I found boring, at least none that I can think of off the top of my head. Now this next little bit is a side tangent, but it'll make sense in a second. Growing up, my mom taught piano. Naturally, as a piano teacher, she wanted me and my siblings to learn how to play music. While several of my siblings did learn instruments, I've always felt I gravitated towards music just a tad more. So much so that I would always participate in my mom's old piano recitals. I used to practice those songs constantly and try to put my best foot forward, and for the most part I was always proud of what I accomplished. Anyways, I bring this up because I'm someone that loves music. I've always had a bit of a soft spot for the creativity that musicians have, so obviously I'd want to take a moment to talk about the music in Spider-Man. And it should come at no surprise that I thought the soundtrack was… just okay. Now don't get me wrong, it wasn't bad by any means, and the main theme is actually pretty catchy. However, the overall soundtrack didn't exactly blow me away either. Honestly, the music is more akin to the MCU movies, which also isn't a bad thing, but those movies haven't exactly had the most memorable themes either beyond the Avengers theme. But that's when the music is actually playing in Spider-Man. Here's what fascinates me about that. If you're just walking around, perched on a building, or just standing still not doing anything, the music is non-existent. All you hear are the busy New York City streets. But as soon as you start web swinging, all of a sudden this wave of heroic orchestrated bliss just rushes over you. While I felt the music itself kind of played it safe, the fact that I can choose to trigger it at any time is fantastic to me. I would have liked to hear more music that was a little less generic, but for what it is, it gets the job done. Alright, so what exactly do you do during your adventure? You're going to be punching, dodging, web swinging, collecting crap, and serving up 31 different flavors of justice amongst a variety of criminals. The game has this way of encouraging you to think on the spot, and does a pretty good job of letting you play the way you want, for the most part, but I'll get into that later. Web swinging does take a little bit of getting used to in your first few minutes, but it feels great when you get going. The momentum you generate combined with Spider-Man's fluid and improvised actions are what makes the web swinging feel so spectacular. This improvised style of gameplay bleeds directly into the combat. You can choose to fight with an assortment of gadgets, utilizing suit abilities, use the environment to your advantage, or just stick to your basic hand combat. The variety of options you have at your disposal is phenomenal. Like for example, you could uppercut someone, air punch, and then slam into the ground. Or you could uppercut, attach a trip line, and force him to the ground. 
Or you could go the lazy route like me and send out a horde of spider drones, a personal favorite of mine. I highly recommend it. Now I personally feel like I couldn't properly do this review without addressing this next point. It's no secret that prior to Spider-Man's release, people compared the combat to Batman Arkham Asylum. I myself even made this comparison when I was describing Spider-Man's gameplay to other people. However, when I made the comparison, I used it in a way to emphasize how much fun the gameplay looks by Spider-Man seemingly drawing inspiration from a previous combat system that felt great. But I've noticed that people have a tendency of twisting this aspect as though it's a negative in Spider-Man's case. Yes, the combat is very fluid, and there are moments where it can seem like a Batman Arkham clone. However, the similarities are superficial at best. For one thing, in Batman Arkham Asylum, you can spam the counter button all day, and 90% of the time, you'll be just fine. But if you try to do that with Spider-Man's dodge... To clarify, I love the Batman Arkham series, they're some of my favorite games to play on repeat. I'm just pointing out that while it can seem like Insomniac ripped off Batman's combat, I don't think that's an accurate or fair assessment. I do have more to say about this comparison, but in a nutshell, Spider-Man on PS4 is not Batman Arkham Asylum with a Spider-Man skin. Now with that out of the way, in addition to the exhilarating and fast-paced gameplay of Spider-Man, you also get to play as Mary Jane and Miles Morales, of which I will get into later. Now, when you're not chewing bubblegum or kicking butt, you're gonna be collecting crap. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Spider-Man is a collectathon. But don't worry, the amount of things to collect is very minimal compared to some video games in this subgenre. The collectibles include backpacks containing fun but ultimately useless fan service, and reactivating police towers to help you locate different icons on the map, such as collectibles and fast travel points. You'll also be going sightseeing by taking pictures of iconic locations, both real and fictional, and completing various side missions like helping Harry out with his science fair projects, or completing a variety of challenges from Taskmaster. And all of this bonus content nets you tokens you can then use to unlock different suits and upgrade your gadgets. And the best part about collecting the tokens is you don't even need to do everything in order to unlock everything you would want to unlock. On a side note, I also appreciated when the game gave me a warning that I was heading to the final boss. With most games, when you reach the final area, you don't normally get a heads up like this that allows you to prepare for the final stretch. As someone that likes to get to the final area and then gather everything before I go to the last boss, this is a convenience I greatly appreciate. Yes, I do realize there are several games that do do this, but there's plenty of others that don't, and it's when those games don't that just honestly kind of drives me crazy. As I've previously stated, I have a lot of love for fantastic soundtracks. However, there's one aspect of video games that goes beyond my love of music. To put it simply, I like to admire all the effort and attention to detail the developers had to put in to make the game look and feel right. While I am referring to the obvious things like web swinging, I even admire the mundane little things normal players wouldn't even stop to think about. For example, I could just stop and stare at a tree for several minutes just to study how it moves to get an idea of what the developer would have had to do in order to make that work right. There's a whole laundry list of things the developer is expected to do, and when those things don't work as intended, it's ridiculously easy for players to overlook the little things that the developer did do right, the things that made the experience work to begin with. These details could be anything from major moments that make or break the experience to completely unnecessary and missable details that are equally just as fantastic. I'm talking about stuff like the fact that Spider-Man comics are a thing in this universe. They did not have to go through the trouble of licensing out the rights to use that copyrighted material, only to use it once and never show it again. Or different moments of continuity, like when Peter's voice pattern changes from calm to out of breath depending on if he's swinging or not. Peter will even resume a conversation he was in the middle of if he gets interrupted. Remember, these aren't things that just naturally happen. Someone had to think of these ideas and then program them into the game in order to make it happen. It's details like these that I appreciate the most. In addition, I also like how your punch button turns into an interaction button, allowing you to wave people or even take selfies. It's such a pointless and useless mechanic, but I absolutely love it. Details like these aren't what makes the game good. Honestly, the game would still be great without these added extras. However, going the extra mile just to inject a little more personality goes a ridiculously long way in making the world you're playing in feel so alive and that much more believable. Another aspect that was done really well was how cinematic the cutscenes are, which goes hand in hand with the music. While recording footage for this video, my parents would briefly pop in every now and then to see what I'm up to. 
My mom would say that it felt like she was watching a movie, and I completely agree. The presentation Insomniac put into Spider-Man really shows just how far they've come from their Spyro and Ratchet and Clank days. Speaking of presentation, the characters were all very well designed. Insomniac managed to nail the look of staple Spider-Man characters while simultaneously adding their own spin to them. I especially like the star-shaped scar on Electro's face, which is a direct reference to his classic suit from the comics. All of the characters look great, except for Peter. So I try to give as honest of a review as I can when I make these videos, and to me, he looks like a potato. To clarify, I don't think that he looks terrible at all or that he's horribly designed. He's definitely not an eyesore. He's just kind of vanilla. But beyond cosmetic details, there's some options they added to make the whole experience more convenient. Like for one thing, you can turn off quick time events. <laughs> I keep hearing people complain about how this game has QTEs, and yet, I don't think those people realize you can actually turn them off. For those of you that don't know what a QTE is, basically it's when a cutscene plays and you'll be prompted to press a specific button at a specific point in time. To turn them off, simply go to Accessibility, and among the options you should have a Turn Off QTEs option. Boom. There you go. You're welcome. Now, disclaimer, it doesn't 100% turn off the QTEs, they will still play at the start of car chases but it does turn off all of the QTEs during the main campaign. Another nice convenience is the fact that you can turn off JJ's podcasts. In this universe, Peter's old boss, J. Jonah Jameson, has since left behind his daily bugle days in favor of a more streamlined style of news delivery in the form of a podcast. While I like this change in development in his character, I'm honestly just not a fan of the podcasts themselves. I realize I'm in the minority on this, but it is what it is, which is why I'm glad they provided the option to turn them off completely. There's nothing specifically about them I hate or I find ruins the experience, I just find them annoying, plain and simple. And if you're someone who enjoyed listening to them, then hey, more power to you. You do you, my dude. Another part of the game I felt was a little lackluster were the lab minigames. They were fun initially, but they got really stale way too quickly to me. I believe it was mostly due to how mind-numbingly easy they were to solve to begin with. Now to be fair, Insomniac has never been known for making difficult games, and that goes double for their puzzles. But even for Insomniac, these puzzles are especially easy. There's no challenge to them, they drastically slow down the pace of the game, and there's no satisfaction for solving them. You don't even get much of a reward for doing them at all. Yes, you do earn some of those tokens I mentioned earlier, but for how many minigames you have to do relative to how many tokens you get, you're just better off doing other side missions which will net you more tokens in the end. Which is why I'm glad they added the skip option for these minigames. Again, just like JJ's podcast, if you're a fan of these minigames, then awesome. Go nuts. Which leads me to where the game needs to improve. Up to this point, I've been doing nothing but praising the game, and while I did really enjoy this title, I do have some bones to pick with it. While my previous viewpoints were commenting on things I didn't particularly like, they were all issues that do have features that fix those annoyances. As previously mentioned, the game does let you play and fight how you want for the most part. However, the same can't be said if you go into an enemy base. In the game, there's different factions of criminals. You've got the mob thugs, demon gang, prison broken inmates, and super teched up silver sable agents. Try saying that ten times fast. Your goal for each base is to clear out every enemy. Each base has a total of six waves, and you always start the first wave in stealth mode. But once you reach wave two, the enemies automatically spot you, and then you're forced to fight offensively like normal. I wish the game gave you the option of completing these missions in stealth mode. Yes, this is a minor complaint, but it would be an added opportunity to allow the player to really mix up how they want to approach a situation. Going back to the Batman Arkham argument, in Batman, different gadgets were assigned to different buttons on the controller. This means that during combat, you could whip out different gadgets and execute really awesome and satisfying combos with ease. Spider-Man in a lot of ways is more fluid and dynamic than Batman's combat, but switching weapons on the fly in Spider-Man isn't nearly as flexible as I'd like it to be. Being able to activate different gadgets at will, rather than having to go to my scroll wheel and slow the momentum of the fight every time I want to use a different gadget, would make combat even more exhilarating than it currently is. Please, Insomniac, in the sequel, allow us to map gadgets to different buttons. I am begging you. So by now, you might have already guessed that I appreciate fast-paced combat, which is why it's really frustrating that the hit detection keeps getting caught on walls more times than I would have liked. 
If you're swinging around trying to chase a drone and you turn a corner too sharp, then Spider-Man will either stop completely in his tracks or start running an entirely different direction than the direction you were going. Or if you're fighting in the air and you get too close to a wall, Spider-Man will automatically stick to the wall, breaking up the flow of your combo. The gameplay is fantastic, but there's something that needs to be done with Spider-Man's hit detection with walls. It is just way too sensitive. And that's saying something, because I'm a pretty sensitive guy. Then there's the MJ and Miles missions. I'm not going to beat around the bush with this one. I hated these levels. So just imagine for a second, you're going on a stealth mission as Spider-Man, but the mission completely sucks all the fun of the main game and instead replaces it with cardboard boxes and you have a typical MJ and Miles level. Seriously, why are there so many freaking boxes? I group these two segments together because they both pretty much play the same with some slight variations. Originally, I was actually looking forward to these segments. I was excited by the fact that we got to play as more than just Peter the whole time. And I wasn't even expecting to play as Miles originally, so when I found that out, that actually came as a pleasant surprise to me. However, they weren't fun to play at all. They limit your mobility, you're playing in a hallway the entire time, and by the time they begin to do anything interesting with them, the game is almost over. There's only one MJ mission that I actually liked, and it was when both MJ and Peter had to work together to take out the enemies at the train station. I wanted to see more of that. That was awesome. Now, I'm all for MJ's missions being stealth-based 100%, but give me some room to breathe. I want to see a room with multiple paths that allows me to choose how I get from point A to point B. While it would still technically be linear, there would be more variety in how I can approach a task at hand, which would mirror the improvised combat of Spider-Man's gameplay. With so much variety and thought put into Spider-Man's combat, honestly, the MJ and Miles segments feel like an afterthought. I'm sorry if you're a fan of those segments, they really do. And the thing that makes me sad about them is that they had the potential to be greater than they actually were. Let's take Miles' levels for example. I liked, no, I loved the fact that they integrated the tech side of his character into his gameplay. But that part of his gameplay is limited to just utilizing items that are around you, which kind of makes it as mind-numbingly easy as the lab puzzles. I think in the sequel, Insomniac should take a page out of Watch Dogs gameplay with his tech. Now I know what you might be thinking, and I realize the reputation that Watch Dogs has, but just hear me out. The gameplay they've implemented with Miles is very similar to Watch Dogs anyways, so why not just go all the way? Regardless of what you think about Watch Dogs, the tech aspect to the gameplay is ridiculously fun to play with. I also felt the game gets a little too repetitive at times. There isn't much I have to say about this one, just the spectacle of watching him stop a car chase tends to wear off after you see it 50 billion times. This isn't something that will ruin the experience, it's just something I felt was worth mentioning. Which brings me to my last point. I felt they showed off a little too much than they should have in the trailers. For context, I felt that in the advertisements leading up to this game's release, they showed off a lot of Mr. Negative. Now I get why they focused so much on him. They wanted to make it look like he was the main villain so that the final reveal would be more impactful, which honestly everyone could see coming a mile away, but I digress. What I'm getting at is there's times when studios and companies will deliberately change commercials just to hide potential spoilers that would reveal major plot points. And Mr. Negative is a major plot point. Marvel with their MCU movies is a prime example of doing this lately. They did it with Thor Ragnarok when they changed the scenes in the trailer where he was missing an eye in the movie. They did it again in Infinity War where Thor has an eye patch where he normally has an eye in the movie. I get these decisions, they make sense, and I'm fine with that. However, Insomniac's marketing team, for whatever reason, decided to do the exact opposite here and actually show a major story point in the trailers. So I'm going to take you back to E3 2017. The first time we're introduced to Martin Lee was during that gameplay demo. Here's how we're introduced to Mr. Negative. And here's the exact same scene in the final product. Hello again. Lee, aka Mr. Negative, isn't even in this scene at all. For context, at this point in the game, Mr. Negative hadn't even been shown yet. Lee is still established as a trusted friend and a surrogate father figure to Peter. 
All matter of surprise had been taken away from the story because this plot twist was already shown off in a demo. I'm someone who didn't know who Mr. Negative was prior to this game, but I do know that there were fans that did, and obviously those fans would see this twist coming a mile away. But Mr. Negative wasn't a well-known character to the general public. I know this because Insomniac even said they specifically wanted to cast a different character that not a lot of people knew about, and that's why they chose Mr. Negative specifically. So showing off Mr. Negative this early in the marketing and then later removing him from the exact scene where he's shown off in the demo makes no sense whatsoever. Despite bugs and glitches having the potential of ruining someone's experience, such as crashing your game or getting you trapped in a room you can't get out of, occasionally you will stumble upon some glitches that actually enhance the enjoyment of your game. If you haven't already, I highly recommend checking out Son of a Glitch's video on Spider-Man. It's well worth a watch. He goes way more in-depth on the subject than I ever could, and goes as far as explaining how you can replicate some of these glitches yourself. There's so much more I could say about Spider-Man for the PS4, and there is DLC that has come out at the time of this review. I will be following up with the DLC at a later date, so stay tuned. But in a nutshell, Spider-Man is a thrilling joy ride from start to finish. The gameplay is exhilarating and dynamic, and the story is what held my interest the most and left me in tears. Despite my frustrations I expressed with the things I want to see improved, I would rate Spider-Man's replayability as annually replayable. If you're a PlayStation owner who hasn't picked up this title yet and you're a fan of open world action adventures, then what are you doing watching this video? You need to add this to your collection immediately. Go. Now. The store is probably closing soon. I don't know what time zone you're in. So anyways guys, those are my thoughts on Spider-Man for the PlayStation 4. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Take care.